It is Thursday, January 25th, and this is The National. Tonight, an exclusive interview with Abdul Abdi. He's facing deportation to a country he's never known. Why he says Canada owes him another chance. With legal pot right around the corner, police say they know how to catch high drivers, but does their test work? But we begin with another political downfall and a familiar arc. Allegation followed swiftly by resignation. This time, a federal cabinet minister. It's really important to believe and support uh, any woman who comes forward with uh, allegations of sexual harassment or, or sexual assault. Uh, and that's exactly what uh, my government and myself, we do. That was the Prime Minister speaking earlier today, a hint of what was to come. This afternoon, Trudeau accepted Kent Hare's resignation from Cabinet. The accusations of sexual misconduct date back to his time as a provincial politician. Hannah Thibodeau now with the fallout. This was an uncomfortable place for some women in the Alberta legislature. A woman who used to work there said she was warned not to get on an elevator alone with Kent Hare when he was a member of the provincial legislature. Kristen Rayworth started working there about 10 years ago when she was 26. On Twitter, she alleges that Hare made sexually suggestive comments to her and other women, making them feel unsafe. She tweeted he once said to her, you're yummy. I am unequivocal in uh, my support uh, for women who step forward with, uh, with allegations of this nature. Prime Minister Trudeau was asked about the allegations at his closing press conference at the World Economic Forum. I haven't yet had the opportunity to speak uh, directly with Kent. Uh, I will in the coming hours uh, and we will have more to say uh, before the plane lifts off tonight. CBC News learned a representative in the PM's office then contacted Rayworth about her tweet. She says the call was respectful and supportive. Just a few hours later, as Trudeau's plane was about to take off, the Prime Minister issued a statement saying he had accepted Hare's resignation from Cabinet pending an investigation. This isn't the first controversy for Hare. Last year, members of a thalidomide survivors group said he made offensive statements to them, including this. Everyone in Canada has a sob story. Lots of people have it bad in Canada. Disabled people, poor people, not just you. And during his time as Veterans Affairs Minister, a retired soldier's wife accused Hare of being insensitive when she asked him for help. And he's like, well, you married him. It's your responsibility. When you put it with the larger Me Too aspect, and especially Patrick Brown going down last night, uh, combined with uh, Trudeau, who has taken a very hard line on these sorts of allegations, it's going to be tough for Kent. Hare says he'll stay on as a Liberal MP. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Hare's resignation comes right on the heels of another one. Last night, Patrick Brown was forced to quit as leader of Ontario's Progressive Conservative Party after suddenly being hit with allegations of his own misconduct. That stunning fall had lots of people talking today. Clearly it was a shock. None of us knew about what the allegations were, where, if there were going to be any allegations, until last night. This is not about the politics of this situation. This is, this is a human situation that uh, is all around us and we need to sort it out. Obviously, um, my thoughts uh, turn immediately to uh, the uh, women who came forward, uh, knowing how difficult it is, it can be. Patrick is one of the most straight-laced, hardest-working individuals I've ever met in my life, and I think it's totally out of character. I spoke to one of the women alleging misconduct by Brown when she was 19 years old. He was a federal MP and she worked at his constituency office. One night they were at an event at a bar in Barrie. Brown doesn't drink, but she says a friend of his gave her free drinks. She ended up drunk at his home where she alleges Brown started to kiss her. She was unresponsive, didn't want it, so he eventually stopped and she asked to be taken home. She told no one at first and returned to her job. Nothing physical happened again, but she says Brown continued to make suggestive comments and offered to take her on a work trip to India. Clearly, Brown's situation looks bleak, but for his party, the timing is also problematic. Ontario is just four months away from a provincial election, and as Ron Charles explains, the Tories seemed to have the momentum before all this went down, but now, chaos. 
Barry, Ontario is where Patrick Brown got his start in politics as a city councillor at the age of 22. In the 18 years since then, people here have gotten to know him. Many of them woke up today in shock. I've been out with him, I've met him. He was always very pleasant, very respectful. He's a dedicated politician, obviously. He's done it all his life. And it's really too bad. The timing is kind of brutal. Brutal for the party that many believed would finally defeat the Liberals after 14 years in June's fast approaching provincial election. But overnight, that party became rudderless, smashed on the rocks, in spite of its sleep deprived deputy leader's attempt at downplay. Was last night a hiccup? Absolutely. But we are going to move forward. Some people would say that it was more than a hiccup. Fair enough. She later apologized, saying the hiccup line was not an attempt to diminish the gravity of the women's allegations. On a day when words can easily come across as insensitive, other provincial party leaders tried to avoid politics altogether. Whether the election happens in June or some other time, really, I don't think that I don't think that's germane to this issue. Um, we're we're going to go ahead and uh, we will, you know, the political fallout will be what the political fallout will be. This is not about me and it's not about my campaign. This is about uh, women uh, coming forward and calling out uh, behavior uh, that they experienced. But that campaign is looming and the Tories are trying to figure out if there's enough time to pick a permanent new leader. Conservative strategist Jason Leader has some thoughts. There's an incredible number of strong women candidates in the, in the party. For example, Carolyn Mulroney, very accomplished, uh, you know, a businesswoman with a, with a political pedigree. In the meantime, the party will attempt to right itself tomorrow, at least temporarily, by choosing an interim leader from among its elected members. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Here's a reminder of last night on this program as well, how quickly Brown's political fortune just seemed to collapse. It started with a news conference hastily called at a strange hour. A couple hours ago, I learned about troubling allegations about my conduct and character. Visibly shaken, he denied the allegations, swore to fight them off and to stay on as leader. His retreat from any questions looked bad. Three key members of his campaign team quit in unison. They had advised Brown to step down, they said, and his refusal meant they had to leave. Conservative caucus held an urgent conference call. Brown was part of that conversation. Not long after, Brown resigned as leader, but not as an MPP. The news cycle's moving quickly. Uh, Catherine Cullen spent the day at the Federal Conservative Caucus retreat. Remember, Brown, of course, was an MP in that party for nine years. Catherine, what has been some of the reaction from his former colleagues today? Rosemary, a few MPs said that they had trouble sleeping last night, not just because of the serious of the allegations, certainly that, but also the speed at which all of this seemed to happen. It's something that everyone was talking about in the hallways today. Also behind closed doors when caucus met, Andrew Scheer, leader of the federal Conservatives, reinforced that the party has a zero tolerance policy for sexual misconduct. Now, while these allegations do date back to a time when Brown was a federal MP and while they do involve someone who was uh, at the time, according to the allegations, a, a a conservative staffer. The conservatives are not looking to investigate, certainly the federal conservatives, what happened. But Andrew Scheer did have this to say today. Well, you know, I certainly invite anybody who feels that they have been a victim of these types of things in the past to reach out to our office. We will certainly uh, do our best to make sure that any program or service uh, that uh, could be made available to them will be. Andrew Scheer also refers to this as a, uh, the allegations of a misconduct in general as a scourge that crossed party lines. Something else, though, that a lot of people were talking about is who might rep replace Patrick Brown as the leader of the Ontario PCs. One person who spoke very passionately about this whole situation today, a name that is coming up a lot, MP Lisa Raitt. You know, how could you not listen to the testimony that those two women gave last night and not maybe flash back to something that may have happened to you in the past? I mean, that's the whole thing about the Me Too movement that's happening. So that's why it's so important for me, Catherine, that people understand if they have an issue and they're in this political world, I don't care what party they are because it happens across all parties. They know that they can come to me and I'm there to help. Now, she did not 
quash speculation today that she might be a leadership contender. Another name being whispered a lot, certainly in the hallways here, MP Aaron O'Toole. Uh, he did not uh, douse the flames of that particular speculation publicly either. Both those say that their attention right now is on the Ontario PCs, what that caucus is going to do, how they are going to move forward. Thanks for that. That's the CBC's Catherine Cullen. She is in Victoria tonight again. Still a lot to unpack here. What does this all really mean for the Ontario PC party? How about that provincial election on the horizon? Lucky for us, all of this happened on at issue night or just after. Andrew Chantal, Althea, all here. We'll tackle that and the Kent Hare resignation as well. A lot more in tonight's panel. And Ian, you have more tonight on a marketplace investigation we first brought you last week. Well, Rosemary, as more elderly Canadians go into long-term care, we've been looking at some of the dangers that uh, people may face. And tonight, the threat from other residents. I was worried when I saw the other residents are younger and stronger and they can, you know, start up with him or there'll be an incident. They're going to, you know, overpower him. Her fear for her brother's safety turned out, unfortunately, to be appropriate. David Common has their story and the bigger picture. One of these men will soon be dead. A stunning nursing home attack as a larger man with dementia becomes frustrated, then violent. It's, it's, it's a horror movie. It's, it's, uh, it's shocking. The attack happened at Baycrest in Toronto, considered one of the best long-term care facilities in Canada. The home told us no amount of care planning could stop all altercations, short of using environmental, physical, or drug-induced restraints. And so, 84-year-old Meyer Sadaway struggled to escape. His hip is broken that night. All of it captured on security video that his sisters wouldn't be told exists for six months. You get a phone call? I got a phone call. And what did they say? I, that Meyer had two falls. Meyer would die four days later. I can't believe They said it. they can explain everything. That's that was, right. they, they'll explain it. So I said, there's nothing to explain. It's very clear what happened with, between Meyer and this resident, how Meyer ended up dead. And violence is not isolated to one home. A year-long marketplace investigation reveals a resident dragging another resident who was screaming, residents who punch, kick, and scratch, and one who died after being struck by another elderly resident. We have a much older and sicker and frailer population, um, so you're getting more people who um, are uh, acting out and have these behaviors. Ontario has Canada's most detailed database on long-term care. It shows in just six years, resident-on-resident resident incidents have doubled from four a day to almost nine. Uh, this is an example. Eric Hoskins is Ontario's health minister. We also showed him video of the attack on Meyer Sadaway. The man on the floor died four days later. I'm very sorry to hear that. That's very, of course, it's very painful to watch. What do you say to a family? who has experienced something like that when there are an increasing number of families whose loved ones are facing violence, abuse and neglect? Well, first of all, I'd say that I'm very sorry to that family. No family should have to witness or experience that, let alone the tragic um, result. But what I will say is that I take these incidents very, very seriously. Frontline workers question that saying if the government was serious, it would insist on more staff in homes to monitor an increasingly unpredictable population. And we have to start with the short staffness. That's where you start. And it's not a minimum of hours that each resident needs. It's about having enough bodies on the floor that are able to actually give the care appropriate to the residents in that home. Staffing levels are largely up to the homes themselves, like Baycrest here, because no province or territory has set a minimum number of care workers, no required ratio of staff to residents. Not the way it is for daycares, where ratios are clear and enforced. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. And tomorrow night, we'll see what Marketplace and his hidden cameras discovered in the nursing homes with the highest reported rates, uncovering concerns from both staff and residents. You can watch it here on CBC Television at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland.
Today I spoke to a man whose case has gotten a lot of attention. Free, free, Abdul Abdi, free, free, Abdul Abdi. That's a protest earlier this month for Abdul Abdi, a refugee who came to Canada as a child and essentially got lost in the system. As an adult, he committed crimes, including aggravated assault. Now he's in the process of being deported to Somalia. But Abdi grew up here, thought Canada was his home, even as he bounced between group homes, a ward of the state without citizenship. And early today, he spoke out for the first time and revealed how little he knew about his status until it was too late. Do you think you have some responsibility, though, as an adult to have said, I should just make sure that I'm a citizen? Or was it just so far from your mind you never thought of it? No. 100 percent, but I didn't have the knowledge. Okay. I didn't, I didn't, like you said, it was far from my mind. Mm -hmm. um, I had a social insurance number, everything like that. So it wasn't like, like I knew that there was something <clears throat> missing. Right. Everybody knows their life and and their responsibilities and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I did not know that I was missing such a key component of sure. being a Canadian, you know? And or you consider I, yourself a Canadian. 100%, yeah. 100%. We'll have more of Abdi's story and that interview a little later in the program. Some of Abdi's situation of growing up in a country without citizenship would be familiar to people in the United States known as dreamers. Today, U.S. President Donald Trump signaled a willingness to help them. The White House proposed a plan to give 1.8 million undocumented immigrants a path to citizenship over the next decade or so. In exchange, Trump's wants, uh, Trump wants about $30 billion for the long-promised Mexican border wall and better protection on the Canadian border. Well, last week's missile alert in Hawaii may have been a false alarm, but according to the scientists who control the so-called doomsday clock, we've moved a little closer to calamity. It is two minutes to midnight. The clock has been moved forward by 30 seconds, symbolizing an increased risk that, and yeah, this is a grim sentence, we will destroy civilization. It is the closest we've been in over 60 years. The group of scientists who control the clock cite some reasons, chief among them, those nuclear tests by North Korea, and escalating tensions in the region. Inaction on climate change is also a factor. The clock was last set to this time in 1953 after the U.S. and the Soviet Union each tested hydrogen bombs. But it can also move backwards. The furthest point from doomsday was in 1991 when the Cold War officially ended. Since then, with few exceptions, the clock has moved closer to midnight. You know, I've grown up with the doomsday clock, hearing yeah. about it, Rosemary. It always sounds so ominous, but I wonder what impact it has more widely. And some people have criticized it for being so political that yeah. maybe a large part of the population tunes it out. Well, and here's an example. Trump, for instance, was singled out several times. They called him an undisciplined and disruptive president. Anyway, it's not... It's not a happy story. <laughs> no, it is not. No, it is not. Ahead tonight on The National, we will take a deeper dive on our top story. Two political resignations in the past 24 hours, both after allegations of sexual misconduct. The Ad Issue panel is here with their thoughts. But first, we'll take a closer look at the system Canadian police are planning to use to catch drivers who are high on pot. Mark Kelly and the Fifth Estate have investigated, and they found some serious concerns about the same techniques being used south of the border. The taxpayers of Canada should be outraged that their precious dollars are being wasted on this program that just results in more innocent people being thrown into jail. On a street where there are more marijuana cafes than ones that sell coffee. You gotta find what you like. It's not surprising the idea of legalizing pot is an easy sell. It's actually happening. There's nothing you can really do to control it. And you're gonna still go back and do it anyways. So why not legalize it? That's the question a very unlikely source is also asking. In his report on BC's marijuana industry, this economics professor says by legalizing then taxing pot, cash-strapped governments could collect an extra $2 billion a year. The report was funded by the very conservative Fraser Institute. Who's going to get the spoil? Since we know it's out there already, the question is to whom should the revenue go? Should the revenue go to people who you really may not like, uh, organized crime and 
in all its guises? Or perhaps should we have, as society, have more access to that revenue to perhaps undo some of the harms that we think it may do? But try selling that idea to government. B.C. Solicitor General says any gains made by taxing pot would be lost in trade with the U.S. They have always made it pretty clear that even the issue of decriminalization, which was being looked at last fall by the federal government, uh, would tighten up the borders and affect trade between the two countries. There are an estimated 17,000 grow-ops in B.C. alone, tens of thousands more in the rest of the country. But police say legalization wouldn't lighten their load. It would just cause more problems. The Fraser Report talks about regulation. Who's responsible for that? More and more, who is? Like, does anybody know? I don't. That report didn't talk about that. Uh, how do you get that taxes in there? Who's going to be responsible for collecting those taxes? Easton's report doesn't address the health or social concerns of legalization. His findings are limited to the bottom line. Just after the report's release, though, the Fraser Institute took pains to point out its own bottom line, saying it doesn't necessarily agree with the report's findings. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Vancouver. People get killed. So that's why we need to, to detect these people and, and test them. As the government moves toward legalizing pot, law enforcement officials are looking at how to deal with high drivers. Already a lot of people are consuming a lot of marijuana. New data released today by Statistics Canada shows how much is being spent on the drug. Canadians apparently paid out $5.7 billion on cannabis in 2017. Over 90% of that was for non-medicinal purposes. So how do officials plan on keeping high drivers off the road? The federal government says it will spend up to $80 million to train hundreds of police officers to use an observational test. But there are concerns about how reliable that test would be. The Fifth Estate's Mark Kelly investigated. I just want to make sure you're safe to drive the way I do it. Okay. It's a decades-old test used across North America. Watch this police dash cam video to see how it works. When I ask you to begin, what you'll do is you'll take a series of nine heel to toe steps on the imaginary line you're standing on. It's administered by what's called a police drug recognition expert, or DRE. The goal? Detecting high drivers. When's the last time you smoked weed? I don't smoke weed. You don't smoke weed? No, not at all. Well, I don't believe you're telling me the truth, okay? But how accurate is well, this test? Have, okay, I need to borrow your arm real quick, okay? A blood test would later reveal the woman arrested in this police video was stone cold sober. They're unreliable is what I've learned. It's a bunch of BS. It's not, it's, it's, it's not scientific. It doesn't make any sense. Well, they put me in a, a jail cell. Mm -hmm. And it's happening in Canada too. This Ontario woman was charged after failing her drug test. She says her only crime was being badly shaken and in shock after a collision. In their opinion, you were impaired. Yes. You were high on drugs. Yes. Criminal charges against her were dropped. So how often does this happen? Well, one of the few studies into DREs done in 2007 shows the accuracy rate of detecting drug impairment is as low as 43%. It's equivalent to flipping a coin. It's 50-50 as to whether we know the person was uh, impaired or not. Rosenblum says Ottawa is investing in a test that isn't scientifically sound. You can't hijack science in the name of uh, law enforcement. <laughs> I don't drink and drive. No way I'm getting behind the wheel when I smoked weed. Too. Even Mad Canada, the lobby group that runs ads like this about the dangers of impaired driving, says the DRE testing is cumbersome, expensive, and subject to legal challenges. And that's what's happening in Georgia. Princess has joined a lawsuit with three others suing the police force that arrested her. One of my biggest goals with this lawsuit is for the actual DREs, the whole process to be gone. You know, in the, in the United States... The American yeah, Civil Liberties yeah. Union has taken up her case and offers this warning to Canadians. The taxpayers of Canada should be outraged that their precious dollars are being wasted on this program that just results in more innocent people being thrown into jail.
drug-impaired driving. Public Safety Minister Ralph Goodale declined our interview request, but his department sent a statement standing by the reliability of the drug test. The race is on to develop a roadside device to detect drug impairment, but the science simply isn't there yet. So for now, police will continue to use this highly contested test. Mark Kelly, CBC News, Toronto. You can watch Mark's entire investigation tomorrow night. The Fifth Estate airs at 9 p.m., 9.30 in Newfoundland. Ahead tonight on this show, my exclusive interview with Abdul Abdi. He's facing deportation to Somalia, a terrifying prospect, considering he's really never lived there. But first, Andrew, Chantal, and Althea. Look at them. They're ready to go here tonight. Sexual misconduct allegations resonating on Parliament Hill in Queen's Park. The resignations, the real political fallout with them next. For every performer you see on the screen, there are literally hundreds of people just outside the range of the cameras, each with a vital role to play. From the master craftsmen in negative film cutting, to the technicians who duplicate our scripts, from the artists who design our sets, to the delightfully eccentric genius who must edit this film you're watching. I don't think this will cut. Because CBC Toronto's job is serving the public, it must keep pace with community development, to go where the action is, to cover and report on a wide range of outside events, whether it be a royal visit, a football game, or a civic election. The Toronto operation has a wide scope. It allows the imagination to stretch farther than a camera cable. Over the years, the gleaming double blue of the huge three camera color mobile units have become as much a part of the fabric of this growing city as her dazzling city hall complex. Now it's okay, look, you stay, I'm all wound up, I gotta get away. No, this place is beginning to bug me, I'll go. No, no, if you stay, I'll go. I'll go, I ain't shit. Why don't both of us? The great bulk of present day programming is packaged and edited electronically under the nimble fingers of the videotape editor and under the eye of the program producer and script assistant. Well, that's the one that's about the third number on after the last one we saw. And we'll leave your levels up for a moment. Master Control. And as the name implies, these men and machines are the masters of CBC Toronto the flagship station of the English network. And it is through this sophisticated gear that every film, tape, or live program is funneled. The nerve center of CBC broadcasting in Toronto isn't hard to find. Just peek under the tower. There you'll see the Jarvis Street complex, the TV building, flanked by the huge Studio 7 on Mutual Street, and the annex on the right housing the CBC executive offices. And over on the left, the one-time girls' school turned radio building. You won't hear much in the way of school cheers coming from the radio building these days, but you hear just about everything else. sound effects department, kicking up a storm. We hope to get this from Washington, a three billion dollar... Uh... CBC Radio News, one of the most versatile and far-flung news agencies in the world, with tape news reports and live feeds from the four corners of the globe. Fine, thank you, Norm. Levels, please, uh, Jim first. British MP Bernadette Devlin flew from Shannon to New York today on a fundraising visit. The world at eight. Good morning from CBC News, etc. That's fine. Thanks very much. Hi, everything okay? Yeah. See, you made it on time for once. Okay. <laughs> 
The World at Eight. Good morning from CBC News. This is Jim Chorley with Rex Loring. Here are the headlines. Tonight on The National, we're watching for a reaction to an explosive new report. Rumors have swirled for months that Donald Trump would fire the special counsel investigating his campaign. It hasn't happened, but tonight the New York Times is reporting that Trump has already tried. According to the Times, which is citing anonymous sources, Trump ordered Robert Mueller fired back in June when it was clear the special counsel would be looking into obstruction of justice charges. But the White House counsel, Donald McGahn, refused to pass Trump's request on to the Justice Department. McGahn threatened to resign, and so Trump backed off. Actor Casey Affleck has backed out of presenting at this year's Academy Awards. It is tradition that the best actor from the previous year presents the award for best actress. No reason was given, but Affleck has faced intense public scrutiny after being sued by two former co-workers for alleged sexual harassment. My values and beliefs are those that we need to move forward to eradicate sexual violence and harassment across the province, across the country, everywhere. I know the court of public opinion moves fast. I've instructed my attorneys to ensure that these allegations are addressed where they should be in the court of law. In short, I reject these accusations in the strongest possible terms. It's not my values. It's not how I raised. It's not who I am. He was visibly shaken and, as it turns out, completely alone. That was from Patrick Brown's remarkable press conference late last night when the Ontario PC leader promised to stick it out and fight back. That resolve didn't last long. In fact, it lasted just hours. He stepped down a couple of hours later, leaving the progressive Conservatives to clean up the chaos only months before a pivotal provincial election. Here to cut through that chaos at issue. Chantal Hébert is in Montreal tonight, Andrew Coyne in Toronto, and Althea Raj is here in Ottawa. I was at the airport earlier and a guy hollered at me, man, it's going to be a good ad issue tonight. So let's see if we can deliver on that. Um, what do you make of the way this unfolded, Andrew? <clears throat> uh, I could not have been worse uh, handled, I suppose you want to say, from a public relations standpoint. Uh, his entire senior staff had resigned when he refused to quit. So I presume it was his decision to go out and do that press conference, which was as disastrous as it could possibly have been. There's a school of thought that says that, oh, the people around him must have known this was coming. Mm -hmm. I think they knew something was out there. I don't think they could possibly have known it was this bad, or you pres presume they would have been, uh, either they would have left before or they would have been better prepared. Uh, what did you make of it, Chantel? I mean, I don't, I can't remember a press conference where someone has looked so stricken uh, and still tried to maintain his, his innocence, which he can do, certainly, but think that he could continue in the job, even with the allegations there. Uh, especially when he himself raises the issue of the court uh, of public opinion. Sure. I think his first <laughs> focus group was his own staff. These people were loyal to him. They wanted him to become Premier of Ontario. They would not stick it out. Uh, and, and that kind of said it all, that there would be no reprieve. I'm not sure you can prepare for something like this if you're a staffer working for a candidate that prominent uh, in an upcoming election. I mean, what scenario, what alternative scenario could you have except to say you've got to go? Uh, and I think the outcome, uh, the saving grace, was that it happened overnight and didn't mm -hmm. drag on over two or three days. I don't actually think these staffers were loyal to Patrick Brown. Um, Andrew, uh, sorry, Ali Khan Valshi, Andrew Boddington, Dan Robertson, they were loyal to the cause. And when it became clear that Patrick Brown was not going to be the vehicle by which they could win the Ontario provincial election, they were very quick to get rid of him. And they will re they will remain there to hopefully, in their minds, I think, uh, be there for another new leader to pick up where Patrick has left off in terms of running on the platform that uh, they spent so much time developing and uh, trying to bring the PC party somewhere 
towards the middle and make them perhaps more uh, so electorally does, favorable to uh, Ontarians. Go ahead. That doesn't talk. change the fact that they were the first focus group that Patrick Brown Absolutely. met. And they were people sure. he knew well, and he couldn't sell it to them. Yeah, and you would expect that these people who've been around him, frankly, for about 10 years, would have known some of these skeletons in the closet. Uh, if there was anything huge in their minds, they would have sort of prepared a plan, and clearly there was no plan. Okay, uh, Andrew, where do you think this leaves the party? Um, again, there's a school of thought that says there's a silver lining in this, that uh, you know, it would be better that mm -hmm. this happens now than that it happened in May or June, and that's true. The other thing you hear people say is, well, he was a pretty terrible leader anyway, and maybe they'll be able to get somebody better, which may be true, but I don't think you can just overlook that the leader is not just the leader. The leader is a whole set of compromises and bargains that have been made between different factions of the party, and, and it's kind of embodied in and enforced by the leader. When you take the leader out, then a lot of those bargains and compromises may well be, you know, up for grabs. And so can they, in the short time they have left, not only find a new leader, but reunify and be, be able, in fighting trim, to actually fight an election and not look like a divided party. That's very much in doubt at this point. Well, because, Chantal, there is now, there are rumors of, of a couple of women maybe stepping in here, Christine Elliott, uh, Cal Caroline Mulroney, and I wonder whether that actually would be a more difficult race for Kathleen Wynne. And there's actually, as, as Andrew says, perhaps this will, this could work out for them after all. Well, it's not that they lack candidates. You add Lisa Raitt to the mix, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that would be viable. But if they do lack time to get this done. There is not, as far as I can tell, a consensus candidate among those. Uh, and uh, the, this is, and to Andrew's point, this is a party that has a number of factions. Possibly the, the, the prospect of a hanging in the morning would focus minds on rallying behind one person. Mm -hmm. But at this point, it's far from clear that there, there is a clear path forward. We're talking about, you know, people say there are four months to the election. We're talking about the actual vote. The campaign is not four months away. It's even closer. Yeah. In uh, some ways, uh, it's already started. Yeah, very true. Althea, what do you make of the fact that um, I think the thing that shocked me the most about what, what Patrick Brown said was he didn't seem to understand the moment we are in uh, culturally. And I, I wonder if that speaks to, and, and, I, and we'll get to Kent Hare, and I think, I just wonder whether that moment has translated either into this country or into politics. And by that moment, I mean the Me Too movement and this sort of mm -hmm. uprising of women. I think it's very easy for us to sort of sit in the television studio and talk about it being detached from an emotional engagement that he must have felt. You know, to have one's political career sort of flash before your eyes, I think that it's understandable that he was completely shocked and not thinking about the Me Too movement or the carefully worded statement that we saw from Ken Hare today. You know, I think that at some point you're sort of grieving for what you spent so many years building and seeing destroyed right in front of you. Let, let me play a clip for the uh, of, for for everyone of the prime minister. This was before Kent Hare resigned, but he was asked sort of about the allegations in particular that came out on Twitter. Here's the prime minister. It's really important to believe and support uh, any woman who comes forward with uh, allegations of sexual harassment or or sexual assault. I am unequivocal in uh, my support uh, for women who step forward with uh, with allegations of this nature, uh, and that continues. Uh, I haven't yet had the opportunity to speak uh, directly with Kent. Uh, I will in the coming hours. So, I mean, this is a little bit different, it's not quite the same, but it is a situation of someone uh, making inappropriate comments, you know, some time ago, uh, and then once they verified uh, with, the, with the woman, the, the accuser, they felt that, he, I guess, he couldn't stay. Chantal, what do you make of that? Uh, that uh, zero tolerance is a very broad term in, in this instance, and that we will be discussing issues like that uh, again on other evenings. Uh, because they, they, we have not yet seen the cocktail of, of the Me Too movement and electoral politics in this country. We mm -hmm. just got a sample of it today. Uh, I don't think this is the last time that we're going to be witnessing those kinds of events over the next few months. Andrew. I, I agree with that. Um, it's a little disturbing, I will say, that we are in the situation where we are forced to take an allegation as fact. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, in these cases, we've decided that these look credible, and that's fine. Uh, 
uh, and you, you're not entitled as a party leader to the same kind of presumption of innocence that you do in a court of law. But we're kind of figuring out as we go along here. Uh, and I hope over time we can figure out exactly what the rules are as to how we're going to weigh evidence on these things, how we're going to assess these things. Because, you know, it's fine to say believe, but we're not every allegation is always and everywhere going to be true. And we will betide us if we come up against one that's not true. We, in this case, we trusted, among other things, the judgment of the news reporters who reported the story. And they're not going to throw a story out there without careful regard for what that's going to mean for their reputation as, as news gatherers. Um, but it's, uh, you know, I, I can't say that Patrick, Patrick Brown is the victim of any great injustice. I just worry, are we figuring this out as we go along where we're going with this? Well, yeah, in the case of, yeah, yeah, I was just going to say, in the case of Kent Hare, I mean, there is now an investigation that the Prime Minister's office has launched beyond just calling the woman making the allegations. But this was not the first time that he got himself in hot water, right? Like, he had made these other questionable comments. Go ahead, Althea. Yeah, I mean, the Prime Minister could have had many other reasons to shuffle him out, him out of Cabinet at the next possible opportunity. Sure. Um, I don't think he expected uh, this to come out. It's interesting, though, that Mr. Hare remains a member of caucus um, while this investigation takes place. I think the lesson to uh, potential survivors out there, victims, is that you will get more justice if you go public than if you sort of make your case known uh, through the formal channels. I think that's something that we've definitely learned this week. Chantal, last word to you on that. Yes, but make no mistake, we've set a bar with the Patrick Brown thing, and that is that uh, people who go public but remain anonymous can end a career, mm -hmm. anybody's career, uh, and, and that troubles me as much as it troubles Andrew. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good news for political junkies like us. At Issue is now a podcast. This week's bonus topic... Trudeau's Liberal government has finally agreed to a Trans-Pacific Partnership deal. My gosh, what the, it's the best bonus topic ever. What does it mean for trade, NAFTA, and Trudeau's pitch in Davos? Look for it on iTunes, any major podcast app, and our website, cbcnews.ca slash The National. When we come back, an interview with Abdul Abdi, who could be deported to Somalia after living almost his entire life in Canada. When you found out that you were going to be deported, because I just, I can't, like... It just seems like that would blow your mind. I don't know. I don't know if you know what a panic attack is. Yes. I had had a panic attack. Okay. It's Ted. Even before she set foot in the secondhand kids store, Tara McCauley had heard about the recalls. Within about five minutes of, of seeing those headlines, I'd already received emails oh, from some of my mommy yeah, friends yeah. just saying, you know, giving me a heads up. A heads up that some of the products she's looking at buying her daughter might actually harm her. It seems to happen with some um, frequency and I, I think product safety is always a concern um, for parents. This is special price. Katie Johnson is going through the store's entire inventory to see if it's carrying any of the more than 10 million trikes, high chairs and other toys recalled in North America by toy giant Fisher Price. The recall was because of these pegs. Kids were falling on them I guess and hurting themselves. Because it's used, Johnson won't bother calling the manufacturer for a repair kit. She just won't sell it. Health Canada is warning about safety hazards with the other products that are part of Fisher Price's voluntary recall. We have uh, some toy, little people's toy cars with the possibility of wheels coming off that pose choking hazards, as well as some fairly serious laceration hazards that uh, can occur with the use of, uh, of a tricycle. There have been more than 75 recalls this year on children's products alone, and the government is hoping that new legislation will compel the industry to report problems sooner, so that Health Canada can investigate, instead of relying on companies to issue recalls on their own. It would afford the government with the ability to order mandatory recalls, which we can't do right now. This expert says the industry has to do more to prevent problems when they're designing products. They have to be able to catch some of these issues before they put this into the production. Analysts say the recalls, as big as they are, likely won't affect Fisher Price's parent company, Mattel, in any meaningful way. The company's shares dipped less than 2% when the recalls were announced and seemed to be on the rebound by the time markets closed this afternoon. Melissa Fung, CBC News, Toronto. 
Well, the economy being what it is right now, everybody's trying to cut back. But before you head out tonight, maybe looking for some Christmas bargains, Lucy Lopez is standing by tonight in our 905 newsroom with some information about some deals you might want to steer clear of. It may be really tempting to buy a knockoff toy and some cheap batteries to go with it. But police have a warning tonight for consumers. Don't risk your life for a bargain. These two packages of batteries look identical. Both of them are cheap counterfeits that could have deadly consequences. Counterfeit batteries are one example of a hazardous product that can leak and even explode. The RCMP is aware of many cases that have been reported to Health Canada, Canada some involving batteries and children's toys. Experts are warning shoppers to stay away from fake batteries, untested toys and electronics. The big problem is when we're dealing with electrical products, if they're substandard, they'll either blow up or they'll, or they'll burn and they'll cause a fire. Problem is, counterfeits are so sophisticated it's hard to spot a real one from a fake. Take these two Bakugan toys. Only one of them is real. Can you tell which one? Always look for a trademark. Counterfeits don't have them. Real toys will always have a company logo and contact information. The fake stuff doesn't. Also check for typos on the price. Why do you think you'd be facing a certain death? I don't remember my language. I don't remember nothing. And you don't know anyone there? I know nobody there. That is Abdul Abdi. And for most of his life, he thought he was a Canadian. But even though he is a refugee, brought here for a better life, Abdi has been in some ways discarded, disowned, and now possibly deported. Abdi came to Canada from a Djibouti refugee camp with his sister at the age of six. At first, they lived with their aunt. But for reasons still unclear, they were taken by Child Protection Services. Over the next decade, Abdi was moved 31 times between foster homes and group homes, separated from his sister, and crucially, the process to get him citizenship never happened. Then Abdi got into trouble. He served time for assaulting a man with a gun and leading police on a chase. Now he could be sent back to Somalia, a country he doesn't remember and only saw when he was a small child. The debate over his deportation is growing. When I spoke to him today, Abdi said his focus is finding a way out of this ordeal. Good to see you. Thanks for making the time. Thank you. Um, I, just, I want to sort of start about what you remember about your arrival in Canada. You were very small, right? I was very young. Um, there was conflicts in my country. My two aunts had, had saved me and my sister from over there. And uh, we came to this country. How old were you? Six. You're six. Yeah. Okay. So vague, vague memories. Yeah. And the idea was that you would live with your aunts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But very quickly you were taken to foster care. Mostly just uh, bounced from group home to group home. So the, I read it was 31. Yeah, 31 different group homes, yeah. It's not ideal. Um, it's, like, um, it's like living in a place with 10, 20, 30, 40 other uh, messed up kids that went through uh, traumatic experiences in their life mm -hmm. and uh, no parental guidance, so all you have is families, these other kids mm -hmm. that are traumatized. So the only thing they can reflect on you is their experiences in life. Did anyone ever say, like, raise the issue of citizenship with you? What did you think your status was? Did you, I mean, you were a kid most of that time, but did you think, I'm a refugee, I'm allowed to live here? What did you think? To be honest, I thought I was just like everybody else. 100 percent. I thought I was just like everybody else, living, living life, trying to trying to live my life. I, I didn't know I was a refugee. I didn't know, I don't know nothing like that. I thought I landed in this country and I thought I was just a Canadian, just like any other kid. And um, it was, it was Children Aid, um, DCS, and their responsibilities as my guardians. And they neglected that. They just didn't want to do what was needed to be done. And then a lot of kids that get taken and put in DCS is because of neglect right. from their parents. So how are you going to take children for, for, for neglect from their families, never see their families ever again, and then neglect them yourselves? It's just, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. 
Uh, so you, you did go to prison for four and a half years? Yeah. For aggravated assault? Yeah. Uh, you pled guilty to those charges? Yeah, I took responsibility for my actions, yeah. And what was, what was prison like? It's, uh, it's everybody's worst nightmare. What would you say to Canadians who might be worried you would reoffend, that you would do something not so good again? <laughs> if anybody thinks that throwing away your second and last chance is something to gamble with, is is crazy. This is my second and last chance. So when you found out that they then wanted to deport you, what did you think? Honestly, I had a breakdown. I don't remember my language. I don't remember nothing, you know? Um, and you don't know anyone there? I know nobody there. No. Your sister was at the town hall with the prime minister. And she asked him about, about you and about your case. And the prime minister said that uh, without talking directly about you, said that Canada would do what is right to balance rules and compassion. So what would, you, what would you say to him? What would you say you would like him or his government to do then? Help, help me and help, and, help, and help kids never be in the situation I am right now. Because I guarantee you, if I just get swept under the rug, <clears throat> that there will be another child in the same position as, as, as I am. Because criminal law and, and, and kids in care are hand in hand. Every, every, every kid in the group homes, if they misbehave even slightly, gets the police called on them. What do you want to, what do you want to do with your life? Say, say this works out. <clears throat> I want to be a father. I want to be a father to my child I miss. I missed out a lot of years of my child and I just want to be there for my child and, 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 and give her the experiences of what to do and what not to do, you know? Because I feel like what makes a person is their struggles in life. Can you believe that you're in this spot? I mean, can you believe that this is happening? No, not in a million years. Not in a million years. The International Human Rights Program at the University of Toronto's law school has taken a keen interest in Abdi's case. And today, after our interview, the students there got to meet him for the first time in person. They came bearing cake. Students at the program are helping to draft a petition to the UN to fight Abdi's deportation. Now, if he manages, Rosie, to uh, stave off deportation, mm -hmm. if he gets to stay in Canada, what, yeah. what is he hoping to do? Well, I should say that they are bringing it to federal court, so they've started that process again. We'll see what happens. But he's already been offered a job, uh, and it would be to help kids who have gotten into trouble, something he says that he would like to do. All right. You'll also find uh, Abdi's full story on our Instagram account, done by our photographer, Evan Mitsui. Beautiful, powerful images. We share every day there. Make sure you follow us at CBC The National. When we come back, the Nationals' moment of the day, but we want to take a moment to remember a filmmaker revered especially by skiers. Warren Miller died yesterday at the age of 93. For more than five decades, he made hundreds of movies about his passion. Once you learn how to ski and ride a lift to the top, the whole world lies at your feet. The soft-spoken narration didn't just sell the majesty of the slopes, but how fun. And now a full gainer. Almost. And how funny the experience could be. Born in Hollywood and raised during the Depression, Miller, perhaps fittingly, became a filmmaker with an entrepreneurial spirit. In 1939, I was 15, and I bought my first pair of skis that same year. He taught himself how to ski and then how to make movies. Films that cross generations, styles, and took us around the world. Austria, Switzerland, maybe a little France. Colorado, Eastern Canada, but uh, you know, a standard Warren Miller ski trip. In this era of rapid transportation, the television cameraman is by no means earthbound. Aerial film can often give a completely new perspective to a particular story. The rapid growth of Montreal is one example. 
With the skyline changing almost daily as new buildings appear, it is necessary to maintain a completely up-to-date stock of aerial footage of familiar scenes. The sight of a most unusual city was picked Away back when the new world first began You can't imagine just how many wonderful things were put together But I've been there and I can They chose the shores of the mighty St. Lawrence So they'd have a And where does all the film go? A lot of it is fed each day through a closed circuit hookup to the network headquarters in Toronto. Yeah, yeah we're all ready to go. We'll send you a little bit of tone. That's at minus eight. Is that all right with you? Okay. In this way, viewers across the country get an opportunity to see events that are happening in Montreal. To fly this film from city to city would waste many hours. But through this closed circuit hookup, items can be exchanged in minutes with points across the country, and in many cases with the CBS and NBC networks in the United States. Expo has welcomed visitors from many far-flung places in the world, most recently from the state of Hawaii. Add to this a syndication film service operated by the CBC, which ships film to subscribers around the globe. And it is evident how much CBC News does to put Canadian events in perspective in foreign lands. The film exchange goes both ways. While an item is being fed to Toronto, a studio in Quebec City is providing a report by a correspondent for use in the local program. This is registered on videotape to be played back when the newscast goes on the air. We are tracking some news that's breaking this hour out of South Korea. Officials say at least 31 people are dead, more than 70 others hurt, after a fire broke out at a hospital in the southeastern part of the country. According to local media, the fire is believed to have started in the emergency room, the cause, though, still being investigated. Also tonight, 18 days after Oprah Winfrey prompted a presidential push with that moving speech of the Golden Globes, the media mogul seems to have put an end to her brief flirtation with a possible run in 2020, telling InStyle magazine, it's not something that interests me, I don't have the DNA for it, but this is important. The interview happened three weeks before the awards ceremony. The new XFL will kick off in 2020, and quite frankly, we're gonna give the game of football Back to fans. He has a distinctive voice. That's uh, wrestling executive Vince McMahon announcing today that the XFL is making a comeback. The Football League was first launched in 2001 as an off-season alternative to the NFL. The hope was to draw in viewers with games that had fewer rules, more violence, and cheerleaders with less clothing. It lasted only one season. McMahon says the new iteration will be different, family-friendly even. It seems the president and first lady wanted to do a little redecorating, so they asked the Guggenheim if they could borrow a painting by Vincent van Gogh. The museum's response is our moment of the day. Yes, that is a fully functional 18 karat gold toilet, and it's what the museum offered. It is considered a piece of art created by an Italian artist dubbed America. It was installed in a fifth floor bathroom for museum visitors to use for a year. There were lineups. The exhibit, though, is over. The museum says it's available for long-term loan. They'll even throw in instructions for installation and care. The painting the White House actually wanted is apparently, they say, prohibited from travel. Though, Rosemary, it is worth noting the curator is a little bit political. On her Instagram, the day that Trump won, mm. uh, she wrote, this must be a day of our revolution to take the country back from hatred, racism, and intolerance. 
So sending a golden throne may have been a message there. I did, I did research this. You were only allowed to be in there one person at a time for a maximum of 15 minutes in case you filed part of the gold off and then walked out. <laughs> Oh, that's why. Okay, that's good to know. Listen, uh, one last thing from the artist. He was yes. asked about this today. He said, what's the point of life? Everything seems absurd. Then we will die and it will all make sense. So just and buy a gold that, toilet. Good night. <laughs> good night. <laughs>